Good afternoon and welcome to Athena's Bible Study. I do know that it has been a while since I have recorded anything. Um, a lot's been going on. Uh, I fell back in February and completely displaced my right ankle and broke my right fibula. So I had to have surgery for that and I am still healing from that. Um, I still have probably about a month left of the initial healing before I can start like physical therapy and stuff like that to be able to once again use my leg. Uh, until then I am in a cast and uh, maneuver around my house in a wheelchair uh, I'm not able to drive I'm not able to walk without putting uh, without not putting pressure on my leg so I use crutches and a wheelchair and a knee scooter to get around all right today we're going to talk about Jesus teaches about the end times. We must be prepared for Christ's return. Now, before I took my hiatus, we were talking a lot about the different teachings of Jesus. In going through the book of Mark, we are Mark 13. And today's lesson focuses on one of the key doctrines of Christian faith, the second coming of Christ. Just as the Old Testament provides ample indication of Christ's first coming, so we have here information that provides a foundation for the belief in Christ's second coming. Mark's Gospel, chapter 13, establishes the basis of for the hope we have of Christ coming again. Alright, so we're going to read verses 1 through 11 in Mark 13. As he was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Do you see all these great buildings? Replied Jesus. Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us when these things will happen. What will be the sign that they are about to be fulfilled? And Jesus said to them, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming I am he and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginnings of birth pains. You must be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them and the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given to you at the time, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. All right. Do not be deceived. Jesus taught in the temple daily during the last days before his crucifixion. While departing from the temple on one of these days, a disciple of Jesus called attention to the magnificent 
of the temple. Jesus replied to this. Jesus's reply to this was that the temple would be completely destroyed. Shortly afterwards, when Jesus arrived, his disciples had arrived on the Mount of Olives. Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked Jesus when the temple would be destroyed. However, Matthew spells out more completely the three questions asked of Jesus by his disciples. When would the temple be destroyed and what would be the sign of his coming and of the end of the world? Matthew 24, 3. First, Jesus warned his disciples, do not be deceived. Jesus said the common troubles that have always been part of the sinful human condition will continue. Wars, earthquakes, and famines. Then in verses 9 through 11, Jesus foretold the persecutions that would come against his disciples. Regarding the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapters 5 through 7, many people never get past the first 16 verses of Matthew 5. In that sermon, Jesus also warned against deceivers. He said, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Matthew 7, 15 and 16. Deceivers have always posed a danger to the well-being of those people of God. Why do we still need to be on guard against deceivers who seek to influence badly believers in Christ? Alright, what do you think? Why should we be on guard at all times against deceivers? Well, Jesus for one said to be on guard at all times because they will come. And again, I say, they will come. Alright, now, when it's talking about the temple being destroyed, we do know that the temple did get destroyed in 70 A.D. It was completely wiped out in 70 A.D. So, that part of what Jesus said did come to pass a long, long time ago. Alright, let's go on with verses 12, and we'll go down to 31. Mark 13, 12 through 31. Alright. Brother will betray brother to death and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. All men will hate you because of me, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. So when times get hard, don't turn away from God. You turn toward God. When you see the abomination that causes desolation standing where it does not belong, let the reader understand. Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the roof of, this house, of his house go down or enter into the house to take anything out. Let no one in the field go back to get his cloak. How dreadful it would be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that this will not take place in winter because those will be days of distress, unequaled from the beginning when God created the world until now, and never to be equaled again. If the Lord not, had not cut short those days, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect whom he has chosen, he has shortened them. At that time, if anyone says to you, Look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For the false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform signs and miracles to deceive the elect, if that were possible. So on 
So be on your guard. I have told you everything ahead of time. But in those days, following that distress, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, men will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds and a great power, with great power and glory. And he will send his angels to gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is near. Right at the door, or right at the door, I tell you the truth, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. A lot of people thought back in those days when Jesus said, when this, this generation will not pass away until these things have come to be. But a thousand years is just a, a moment in time to God. So, you know, there's no way to know when this stuff is going to happen or whatever, you know, whether it will happen in our lifetime or, you know. Okay, recognize the sign, recognize signs of Christ's return. Jesus said that when Jerusalem was seen to be surrounded by armies, it would be time for its residents to escape. The early church historian Ubisus, Ubisus says all of the Christians in Jerusalem heeded his warning of Jesus and escaped to the city of Pella about 65 miles north northeast of Jerusalem before Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed by Romans in 70 AD. What Jesus said about signs of his coming and the end of the age is much like what Joel the prophet said about this. Jesus said that when he comes again, he is going to be visible. The Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Jesus said that when he comes, he will send his angels together to him, all who belong to him, from every part of the earth and heaven. Jesus said, when you see these things, you will know that the end of age, or the end of the world, is at the doors. Many today, who normally identify themselves as Christians, do not believe Jesus was the Son of God, nor that he rose from the dead, nor that he will ever come again. These facts accentuate the need for true believers in Jesus Christ to earnestly contend for faith which was once delivered to the saints by Jesus and his apostles. Jesus' assurance is that he shall endure or pers persevere unto the end the same shall be saved. Do you find this assurance especially helpful? And if so, why? All right, always be ready. Let's go to Mark 13, and we're going to read 32 through 37. Mark 13, 32 through 37. The day and hour unknown. No one knows about the day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It is like man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with his assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keeping watch because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, 
whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. All right. The disciples are curious about the signs of the end times and Jesus' return. Reading Jesus' answer to their questions can be overwhelming, yet three promises rest among these signs. Number one, God never sends judgment without a previous warning. Number two, even if believers are required to face opposition, God will be near them, giving them courage and providing them with the words to speak. And number three, false prophets will appear, showing signs and wonders, but the elect will be guarded by God. This passage assures us that although we don't always understand everything about future events, we can trust that God will tell us when, what we need to know and will strengthen us for what he needs us to face. As you read these verses, your response may be one of confusion or fright, but read them through to the end because Jesus' return, victory for him and his followers is assured, and he begins his forever reign in the new and peaceful kingdom. Alright. Jesus Christ will come again, for he plainly taught, Of that day and hour knoweth no man, seeing that no one knows when Christ will come again, we are able to be, we are to be spiritually alert and prayerful, always prepared for his coming. We should not regulate our spiritual condition based on vain speculations about when Christ will come again. We should maintain our spiritual vitality by obeying the command of Christ to always be ready for his coming. In conclusion of his discourse Jesus told a parable that teaches we should keep ourselves always prepared for his coming simply stated this parable says we need to go about our lives as believers in Christ doing the work in this world Christ would have given us to do living in faithfulness to him keeping ourselves spiritually alert and prayerful simply stated we prepare ourselves for Christ's coming again by living for him as our Savior and Lord. For almost 2,000 years, Christians of the Orthodox faith have been confessing that Jesus Christ ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And from there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. Written in the Apostles' Creed. This is still our confession of faith we still wait for Christ to come again. God in his wisdom has kept hidden from us the time of Christ coming again. Would you say it is actually good that we do not know when Christ will come again? I think so. Because if we knew, then we would we would not live right. I'll just put it that way we would live however in sin and then when time's drawing close to Jesus coming back then we would then start scrambling trying to be good enough to get into heaven and that's just not how it works you're supposed to live like Christ would want you to live at all times. We all sin. We all fall short of the glory of God. However, choices are very important. Going out and partying on Friday night and then asking for forgiveness on Sunday morning Yeah, God's going to forgive you, but is he going to 
hold that against you. Because, or another example would be living evil, being mean to people, doing this, doing that, you know, just living a horrible life Monday through Saturday. And then showing up at church on Sunday morning and having the perfect little life and what have you. Are you going to wind up in heaven? Not if your heart's not right. And if your heart was right, you would be living right and not living sinfully six days out of the week. All right. Always be prepared for Christ to come. If Christ comes in five minutes, are you prepared? Where's your heart at right now? Can you guarantee your spot in heaven? Can you tell, look God in the face and with no lying say, I am your faithful servant. I lived my life in hopes to please you. Can you say that? If not, then you really need to start looking at things on the inside of yourself. Alright, life-related learning. Our redemption drawing near. Winter brings cold gray days. There is an absence of vibrant color. No green leaves, flowers are few, and the sky has been robbed of its deep blue glory. It can be a gloomy time, leaving us longing for spring to come again. There are early signs that spring is approaching, and we find ourselves looking for them. I hate this being spring is here now and I'm stuck inside. I'm going to miss the entire season of spring because I broke my leg at the, close to the end of winter. I look at spring through the windows of my house. Where I live on Alabama Gulf Coast it is often quite warm, even in the winter months. Sometimes I had to have the air conditioner running on Christmas Day. Warm spells in winter are like false springs that fool some plants, causing them to bud with new growth, only to have it killed when the sudden plunge in temperature that freezes them. Plants are deceived. However, there is one tree that can be depended on not to be fooled by warm weather before spring arrives. The pecan tree never buds until spring does, in fact, arrive. Jesus said we should watch for signs of the end time in anticipation of his return. We also warned, he also warned that we not be deceived by those who come with false doctrines and speculate about the time when he will come again. Over the centuries of Christian history, many have tried to predict the time of Christ coming again and they have been heralds of false spring. Jesus said there will be wars, famines, contagious diseases, earthquakes, turmoil between nations, and distress over the troubles coming on the world. These happenings have always been a part of the simple human condition and perhaps will become more pronounced as the return of Christ and the end of the age draw near. In any case, Jesus said that when we see these things, look up and lift up your head 
for your redemption draweth nigh. In the gloom of winter, our spirits are lifted when we see the signs of approaching spring. We can be downcast and discouraged by the troubles of this world if we allow ourselves to be, or we can see in these things the evidence that the return of Christ is drawing near along with our complete redemption at his coming. Jesus emphasized being prepared for his coming again. The time of Christ coming again may be near and one thing we do know for sure that time is drawing near every day and so also is our redemption. For this rejoice, rejoice, rejoice in the Lord. All right, here's some readings. Grab a pen and paper, write them down, pull out your Bible, and read them. And I will give you the verse, and then I will read a little bit of commentary about it. And you can just pause the video or go read them afterwards and then listen to the commentary. All right. Daniel. Start out in the Old Testament. Daniel 2, 26 through 36. Daniel 2, 26 through 36. And this one talks about Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Disclosing the message in King Nebuchadnezzar's dream required both divine revelation and Holy Spirit-inspired interpretation. God granted these gifts to Daniel, and he was faithful to give God the credit for it. When God grants to us knowledge and wisdom that are helpful to others, do we seek from this our own glory, or do we seek glory for God the giver? All right, number two, Daniel 2, 37 through 45. Daniel 2, 37 through 45. King Nebuchadnezzar's mysterious dream revealed a sobering truth. Even for the greatest monarch in the known world, the colossal figure in the king's dream revealed the rise and fall of earthly kingdoms under God's sovereign domination, showing God rules over all. The golden kingdom of Babylon would pass, as would other kingdoms. Only God's kingdom lasts forever. Number three. Daniel 12. 1 through 4. Daniel 12, 1 through 4. This one's going to be talking about end times. God revealed to Daniel that a time of great trouble will be associated with the end of age. But also, God will be present with his people, giving them deliverance and resurrection. Here, more than five centuries before Jesus' resurrection, the doctrine of the resurrection for the saved and for the unsaved is clearly taught, as was taught by Jesus. All right, moving over now to the New Testament. First one is Matthew 25, 1 through 13. Matthew 25, 1 through through 13. Be spiritually alert. Jesus' story about the ten virgins is an exoneration to us as believers in Christ, waiting for his return to keep the flame of God's love burning in our lives until he comes. The Apostle Paul explained that the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost who is given to us Romans 5 5 to keep the flame of love burning we must be filled with the Holy Spirit 
Number five, 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 9. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 9. Terrible times. In this, his last letter to the new, in the New Testament, dated 60, AD 66, the Apostle Paul characterized the last days as a dangerous time because of the prevalent evil. The list of evils outright crime and violence in the last days is all the explanation needed for the danger of living in the last days. Sin runs everything, always has, always will. To the end of the age, God is our refuge. All right, and number six, Revelation 19, 11 through 21. Revelation 19, 11 through 21. Jesus returns. In a vision, John saw Jesus coming as the conquering king over all the forces of evil. This will be the consummation of the victory Jesus won over evil by his death, resurrection, and ascension. Christ's victory over evil is a present reality in all who trust in him for salvation and his victory will become apparent all the world when he comes again. All right. rest of the book is the Easter story so really no sense in going over that because we've already had Easter I will tell you that Jesus is betrayed by Judas Judas Iscariot on the in the Garden of Gethsemane or guess the name. Anyway, I never can say that word. And he's taken before the high priest. They have him beat. And have him put to death. Three days later, the stone is rolled away. Jesus lives. And he walks among the living for another 40 days after he is resurrected. And after that 40 days, he takes his disciples, tells them to wait for him. And then he, after they eat together, and they watch him ascend up into heaven. And when he ascends up into heaven, there's, they're standing there still looking up at the sky in wonder. And we're going to have a door slam. But then some angels are standing there, and they're like, why are you looking up? Jesus is not there. He's up in heaven. So, anyway, that completes the story on that. And with that, that is what I have for you guys today. Um, I'm going to try to at least record a couple of videos a week. We'll see how that goes. Trying to get back in the swing of things. But until next time, I will see you guys later. My name is Athena. This is Athena's Bible Study. And y'all guys have a wonderful day. Bye.